do we, get, we encounter this strange thing that some people call the doctrine of eminence. And it's, a, it's not really an express command, it's just an observation from a, a collection of teachings. The word eminent, I mean it by this word, the next expectation. Not to be confused with two other words that are very similar in their spelling. Imminent, in the sense that uh, only God is tr transcendent, far above us. That's with an I and an A in the eminent. And it's always with us and active on our behalf. That's what that word means. Nor should this word be confused with eminent, with an E and an I, uh, which is a title of honor reserved for persons of outstanding distinction. Those are two words spelled very similarly, but mean something quite different. Eminent with I, the both beginning and in the middle there, is the next expectation. If something is imminent, that means there's no required intervening event. And it's, it's the next thing to happen, so to speak. So the doctrine of imminency. Believers, we, we, we assert that believers are taught to expect the Savior from heaven at any moment. You find that in Philippians 3.20, Titus 2.13, Hebrews 9.28, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and 4 and, and 5 and Revelation 22. You can jot those down, circle them in your notes, and at your leisure, check it out. But you'll discover those are just uh, a few examples, uh, seven actually, uh, examples of uh, justify our, we are taught to expect Jesus before this session's over, before the weekend's over, whenever. It's the next thing to happen on someone's agenda here. We are to expect him at any moment. That expresses hope and a warm spirit of expect expectancy. That's the first Thessalonians uh, uh, one of those there. And it should result then in a victorious and purified life. If you really believe that and really apply it to your walk, your walk will improve. You're expecting him to show up at any moment. He doesn't want to catch you in some places that you don't want him to find you at. Right? So, it's interesting that Paul included himself among those who look for Christ's return. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and 2 Thessalonians 2, you see that's Paul's tone. He had an expectation that he might be alive when Jesus comes back. And so he, and Timothy was admonished to keep this commandment without spot, unbeakable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, there again, Paul taught Timothy, his protege, to live his life in moment-by-moment -moment expectation of the Lord's return. That's what we call the doctrine of imminency. Jewish converts are reminded that yet a little while and he, shall, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. That's in Hebrews 10. Jesus himself said, Occupy till I come. People that get carried away with the rapture, and we'll talk about that in a minute, seem to dismiss the fact that our, our command was to occupy, not to put our feet on the desk and wait for the Lord's return. Daniel is a great example for us. He's in slavery in Babylon. He knows that the 70 years captivity are almost over. About 67 of the 70 have gone by. He doesn't sit there, oh, I hardly wait. If you, the, the, the captivity is almost over. No, what does he do? He goes into prayer in chapter 9. The first 20 verses of chapter 9 are not about the 70. He is in prayer so intense that even in the translation, in your English translation, you can feel him tremble. As you read those passages, you'll see, see the verbs the, pick up as he gets more and more intense in his prayer in those 20 verses. And Gabriel interrupts that, comes and says, by the way, have I got a message for you? He gives him those four verses that we've been studying. Occupy till I come. The expectation of some were so strong back then that they had stopped work and had to be exhorted. That even was in Paul's day. They had to return to their jobs in 2 Thessalonians 3 and to have patience in James 5.8. So that, you know, that expectation was, was had, had, uh, overly applied, so to speak. So there are two extremes we encounter. One I call rapture-itis, and the other one is rapture, and that's rapture paralysis. People who get so wrapped up with the Lord's coming the day after tomorrow, they don't do anything. They park themselves and they become so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good, as some people put it. And we'll call that rapture-itis for lack of another term. And then the other aspect is rapture mania. These are people that get so wrapped up, they're setting dates. Now, there are dozens of admonitions not to set dates. Again and again and again and again. 
But nevertheless, that doesn't hold some people back from publishing books that it's going to be, you know, on October 12th of year X or whatever. The date setters, and we'll talk a little bit about them. Let's take the rapturitis. And I'm going to suggest this may be just a uniquely American dementia. Because there are people in the States that have that preoccupation. To which I have a, que a question. Just because I believe I can show you from a text that the church will not go through the great tribulation, that's a specific time, where do we as Americans get the arrogance to assume we'll escape what most of the body of Christ in most of the world for most of the last 2,000 years have had to endure? It's called persecution. Don't confuse persecution, which Jesus promised us, with the great tribulation, a specific event that we will spare it, be spared from the time of. We'll get into that too before we're through here. Thank you.